Welcome to episode 63 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this is an interview with the chair of the Los Angeles Libertarian Party affiliate, Angela McArdle, who has started her campaign to run for chair of the LNC, the National Libertarian Party, for my non-libertarian audience. Again, as I said in my interview with Josh Havaka, who was successful, by the way, in his run for vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Florida just this last weekend, I am supposed to be on break right now, and that break is intended to allow me to work on some changes for season three of Liberty Dad. Some changes that I think people will enjoy. But I have some outstanding commitments to complete, and a few opportunities have popped up, so here I am. In this interview, I aim to ask Angela some tough questions. You be the judge with that, and for now, let's dive right in. All right, welcome everybody. I've got Angela McArdle here, and we are in Florida, Lakeland, at the Libertarian Party of Florida's convention. It is Sunday. We are wrapping things up. Good afternoon. It is now noon o'clock. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. So I asked Angela if she would come on the show, and I'm going to be honest with everybody. I have not seen any of the other shows that she has been on, so I hope that none of the questions that I have prepared are going to be anything that you've heard before. I did tell her that I was going to ask some very tough questions, so, or at least in my mind, they're tough. You be the judge. Let's get started with some easy stuff, though. You're running for chair of the LNC. What motivated you to run? And it feels to me like it's, I'm, I'm relatively new to the party, but it feels early to announce a run. Is it early? Yeah, I absolutely announced early. I actually announced in November of 2020. Okay. And the reason I announced early is because of the National Libertarian Party's failure to rebuke the lockdowns. Okay. I saw people just absolutely losing faith in the party. And I was like, Member- membership is going to hemorrhage. You know, we're going to tank. Right. And I talked to several people and I was like, if I ran for chair, would you stay in? And they said yes. And I was like, I'm going to do it. You know, the timing is right. I said I wouldn't do this until I had been chairing the county party and active on California for at least a few years. I had Mm -hmm. the experience under my belt and I was like, time is now. Let's do it. Gotcha. All right. So that's, that sounds pretty interesting. And I think that, uh, that leads into my first question. So as chair of Los Angeles, tell me about the growth uh, that you've had and the work that your affiliate has accomplished under your leadership. There is so much I'm not going to be able to list it all here because it's going to bore everyone to tears. Okay, don't I will, be bored. I will tell you, when I inherited the party, it was a complete mess. Infrastructure-wise, activism-wise, the infighting was so bad. We got thrown out of a restaurant for being noisy and disruptive. Oh, wow. People were threatening each other. It was completely insane. So membership has gone, as of right now, from about 170 members when I became chair to around 250 now. Okay. I anticipate that that's gonna go up considerably because we're gonna have a lot of renewals over the next month because our county convention is coming up July 10th at the Reason Foundation. Thank you, Reason. Awesome. So 250 right now, it'll probably go up by at least 20. Okay. So I'm, I feel comfortable saying we've increased membership by 100 people. That is quite a big chunk of change. Gotcha, when, when you say membership, do you mean active members or just like registered members dues paying members okay we actually have a lot of people who are active who are not dues paying members which may sound weird but a lot of them are non-voting anarchists okay and my position on that is to take anyone and everyone who believes in libertarian principles if Mm -hmm. they want to come and help our party as long as they're not trying to subvert us and you know be like gop operatives right gotcha okay Uh, there's a lot more though like we had Basically, no online presence. Our website was terrible. It didn't work. We have a functional website now. We have very strong social media presence. Mm -hmm. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out. That didn't really exist before. The most important thing to me is we actually have 
a lot more people who will collaborate and participate at the county level because before it was like just sort of this exercise in futility. I felt like it was something out of Conan the Barbarian pushing the wheel of pain. We have this boring, stale meeting every month. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets accomplished besides reading some boring officer reports. Now we have collaboration. We have a, a team dedicated to to policy and data analytics. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, and, and it's not just the XCOM members. People are actually active and they want to join. We've had a lot of new growth and new members who are active, and we haven't pushed out old members. A lot of them has act, have actually become invigorated and like active, and they do a lot more now than they used to. Okay, you know they used to just sort of push papers. It's like it's like now we actually work as a team to mm -hmm. accomplish meaningful change. Okay, and we see it across the board. It doesn't matter like what caucus someone's in, if they're old guard or new guard. We it's like we get along and do things. I, I didn't even think it would be possible. What kind of things are you doing? Right now we're working on rebranding the party so that we have cohesive messaging. Mm -hmm. We are working on putting out a policy proposal for housing. We have a huge homelessness crisis in Los Angeles County mm -hmm. and it's a big problem and there's a lot of insane corruption at city council and a lot of nimbyism. Mm -hmm. So we have a group of four people who are dedicated to putting together a policy draft. We've got people actually doing public comment. We are submitting opinion pieces, at least getting them out there, whether or not, okay. you know, whether or not L.A. County is actually acting on them. We're making ourselves known at the city council level. We've actually got a couple of people who are not on city council, but who are on committees mm -hmm. who have joined our party. Okay. And so they feed us information and help us get connected. We have, obviously, we were very active during the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. We managed to maintain in-person meetings. Uh, oh, wow. So LA County is so big, we are broken up into regions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seven active regions right now. And so we had at least three or four of them maintain consistent in-person meetings when every single public venue was shut down. So I think that was pretty phenomenal. Uh, our business meeting is actually online. Mm -hmm. And that has been online since I took over. It got rid of all of the infighting, and it facilitated more involvement from people because traffic in LA is a huge barrier to attendance. Okay. It's we would don't we we had less than half the participation that we have now before we had uh, online business meetings. So now people can get on and workshop their ideas and propose this, propose that. You know, we have plenty of meetings that take place to sort of workshop ideas and like policy teams, but. And the most of those take place online too. Okay. So we've had so much activity. There's just there's so much I probably can't even name it. Gotcha. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of things going on out there, and that's great. Uh, I'm the chair in Duval here, up not here in Jacksonville. I like to say here in Jacksonville because I'm usually recording from Jacksonville, but up in Jacksonville, northeastern Florida, is where I'm out of Duval County, and I'm the chair there. And we're kind of invigorating ourselves, getting going. We've got three candidates that were speaking here at the uh, the convention. This last Friday, it was pretty phenomenal. A lot of people are starting to, you know, really look and say, "Hey, wow, you guys got something going on up there." So I'm, I'm really excited, and it sounds like you've got something similar. So I'm, I'm curious, what other roles and challenges have you faced in the LP anywhere? Oh man, so many. So I became state party secretary in California in 2018. That was huge because California is the biggest, the the biggest uh, libertarian party state affiliate within the country so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a massive job it's like 20 hours of work a week just to just to maintain that's not even to go above and beyond okay so that was really challenging and i was quite sick during part of that year because mm -hmm. i have crohn's disease and so i did a lot of work from the hospital oh wow but uh there was one period where i was hospitalized i think for two weeks and i didn't miss a single meeting it was kind of ridiculous but i was able to just attend everything remotely so that was really challenging, but I made it work. Uh, thankfully, my health is a lot better now. And it's good to hear. you know, we've had some we've had some conflicts in California. Mm -hmm. We've had some membership expulsions, and I've had to deal with that and try to do it with as much decorum and grace as you possibly can. But we made it work. Mm -hmm. I would say that we've had we've had some infighting at the state level too, and we've had some conflicts. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really like about California is that we're generally able to put any fighting and conflict over elections aside. 
and just continue to work with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's like it presents a, a real challenge because people's feelings get hurt or they feel resentful or they feel betrayed. You know, why did you endorse this person and not me? And at the end of the day, you just have to be an adult and you just suck it up and put it behind you and work together. And I have encountered that a few times. Okay. So many, so many things, you know. Right, right. No, I'm sure there's a lot. I mean, we've had a, we've had a few interesting moments in Duval. Florida had some interesting moments, some really interesting moments. Actually, they were subsiding just as I started to get involved at the, at the local level, and I wasn't, you know, I was only hearing a little bit of what was going on or what was, you know, ending and kind of on its way out um, at the state level. So. I fortunately did not have to experience any of it. Uh, it can be very difficult when you come in as a person like me because uh, when I came in, I wasn't super excited to jump in and do things necessarily, but I did want to get in and get my bearings and then eventually get involved in stuff. And the challenge that I've seen is that I mean we had a few rough personalities in the LPF after I got in there and you don't always have the history and it, for me I don't like taking sides until I've given somebody an opportunity and it doesn't matter who they are and I've, I've, as I've entered the fray I guess of national level politics you know between different states and whatnot I've had that same challenge you know and, and it's very interesting so I'm glad that I was able to to not have to come in while the you know while all hell is breaking yeah. loose, because uh, that would have been very very frustrating. And I could see where a lot of people, even people like me, would have said, "Nah, the same for me," you know. So so it's uh, I, I guess it's stuff that's there, but we got to work through it. Yep. So you're you're getting ready to run for, or not? You're getting ready, but you are working on running for LNC chair. And so one of my questions is. Uh, you know, I have several questions, and as we go along, the questions I think are going to get a little bit more challenging. Um, again, you be the judge, but uh, what successes or anticipated, if you heard that, folks, that is thunder, that is our nice Florida rain coming in, but what successes or anticipated successes are you looking forward to building off of the current LNC chair, or any previous one for that matter? I am hoping that we get as many states their ballot access back okay. as possible. How many lost? Was it two? I, I think I'm at two in my count. No, it was it was possibly up to 18. Oh, wow. Now, a lot of them have reclaimed it. Okay. So I'm not sure what the count is right now, but there are lawsuits. I'm Like, New York is still waiting. Okay. So I am hoping that New York maintains their ballot access. They're in the midst of a lawsuit and there are disagreements about what direction that lawsuit should be taking and mm. arguments they should be making. Gotcha. So I'm hoping that that gets, you know, resolved right. beforehand. And I'm really hoping that the CRM program gets adopted more throughout the states. There are a lot of states who use national CRM. That's actually a project of the vice chair, Ken Moore. Okay. But I am really hoping to have that integrated. You know, California, we don't use the CRM mm -hmm. because we have a more complex affiliation um, option where people who live in one county can affiliate with another, and the national CRM is not able to accommodate that yet. I'm hoping they will be, and I have definitely raised that concern. And um, yeah, so that's being worked on right now. Hmm, what else? I am hoping that National resolves very artfully and without overstepping their bounds, resolves some conflicts with some of the state parties. Okay. I would like to see that happen. Okay. Is because I'm relatively, I came in about two, 2017 and I came in at the local level, so I wasn't really looking at state, let alone national. Um, I think in 2018 I did watch the debates and I didn't know any of the four candidates that were, uh, I, I didn't know anything about them, never heard anything about them. Right, so I know that Nick Sarwark was one of the candidates, and he had been chair, I think, twice before that. Uh, but again, I was very ignorant of any of the personalities. So, is state conflict is that relatively common over the course of LP history? Well, I guess it depends on what you define as relatively common. We had a big problem in Oregon a few years ago. Okay. 
So I don't think that it's something that's constant, but okay. it comes up, and it comes up every few years at least. Okay. Is that something that, uh, for newer people, is that something that they should be kind of concerned about? I think right now, yes, it is. Okay. I think it is something that people should be concerned about. I think that fighting at the state level to the point that the state party could be fractured or raise an issue to the national party, it's really concerning. Mm -hmm. It's damaging, and it affects other states. Even like a different state? like So I'll, I'll give you the basis for that particular question. Sure. Um, we have three candidates that are running in Duval, and one of them asked me, he was like, you know, we were talking about the things that were happening and I was conveying just kind of what I was seeing spoke about online and he was like you know is, is this going to be a problem because he wanted to know if this is going to be a problem for his candidacy and I said you know I don't think so um, you know it's always possible that somebody pulls out something that they saw online a comment whatever and then ask you about it uh, so, so I mean there's, there's no way to get around that but I, well, I was like I don't think it really is going to affect you too much locally other than maybe a question or two Right. Right. I think that's generally correct. It's more, you know, when state parties fracture or they have a fight and mm -hmm. they ask the LNC to get involved or don't if the LNC gets involved regardless. Personally, I think that the LNC needs to let state parties do their thing. And I believe the role of the national party should not be to micromanage the states. Okay. I think they should not get involved unless it's necessary and unless they've been asked to. Okay. So... You know, that's something that I hope National will have a good handle on. Okay. And even though there are some potential conflicts right now, I hope that it gets ironed out and that it's not something that carries into the future because it sets an ugly precedent. Right. Once, once the LNC starts meddling in one state, sometimes you can have unhappy people in another state say, ah, I right. see what they're doing. I'm going to use that to my advantage. And right. it sets off this tidal wave of everybody begging the LNC to do whatever it is they want the LNC to do. Right. And that is not the good way to manage a grassroots bottom-up organization. Gotcha. Yeah, it's similar to my complaint about, and I don't want to name any names, but you see you know, certain personalities online mm -hmm. and people insist that they take a particular position and maybe they don't right. or they kind of sidestep it. And I overall, I, I get the point of why people are wanting them to because it's like, hey, you're a you're a a big voice but on the other hand I think it has that same effect where let's say I was a notable personality and I had a lot of people that were following me and someone said hey you need to take a stand against this particular thing whatever this thing is it doesn't matter if I do I feel like that kind of sets me out that would set me up for somebody to say you need to take a stand now on this other thing which was very closely related and if you don't you're being you know hypocritical you're you know you're favoring this particular person that person whatever the case may be sure um and and so i think that i, I agree that uh, with what you're saying that you know unless they're being asked to assist then they probably should not yep unless it's absolutely necessary they should take a stand on national issues mm -hmm. uh, i think they should absolutely take a stand on state political issues when it advances the libertarian agenda for that state. Mm -hmm. But generally, I believe that the LNC should edify and build up the state parties, not meddle or, and certainly not tear them down. Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. You're elected to chair. What would be your biggest fear in, in, in being in that role, either during it or after it's complete, however long that might be? The destruction of state parties, absolutely. Okay. I don't want to see state parties trying to disaffiliate from national or split into different parties or faction wars. That's a concern I have. Okay. And do you have an idea in your mind how you would uh, reduce, uh, or, or I don't want to say prevent, but aim to minimize that from happening? Absolutely. Um, First of all, by not overstepping my bounds. Okay. By being absolutely transparent in my opinions. By not doing, you know, backdoor favors or deals with people because of uh, caucus orientations mm -hmm. or they think I owe them something. you got to be absolutely honest and forthright. Um, I think that is a problem that some people on the LNC have, mm -hmm. and it doesn't set a good precedent. But I would like to set a new precedent of the chair being very transparent about whatever the chair is thinking or opinions. Gotcha. Okay. There's a lot of hostility 
yeah. out there. And one of the things that I am very notorious for is telling people, like I look at it and say, if I have a, 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 an issue with you, let's say you and I are kind of at odds, my position is that I should be drawing this line in the sand and no matter what you might do, I don't cross that barrier. And then I look at it and I tell the other person the exact same thing. And I say, like, this is how we reduce the hostility. So I'm curious if you've, uh, and let me back up, how long have you been associated with the Libertarian Party? Officially, I don't recall if it's 2016 or 2017 when I first joined. Okay. Okay, so uh, a good five or six years, yeah. somewhere around there. So in your five or six years, um, and without naming any names, uh, we don't want to we don't want to stir up any more trouble. Is there anyone that was hostile to you at either the local, state, or national level that you were able to reach out to, resolve the differences, and now is an ally? And if there is, how'd you make that happen? Yeah, definitely. I think that one of the one of the best skills I have is being helpful to people mm-hmm. and not holding grudges. Okay. So yeah, there was there was an issue at the 2019 and the California convention where I was, I was very angry. Mm-hmm. I felt that people had mistreated me publicly, undermined a lot of the work that I had done as secretary, and it really made me disgusted. And what you have to understand is like, okay, we're the Libertarian Party, we're the party of principle, mm-hmm. we, we stand for X, Y, Z, but we're made up of imperfect people. Right. And you have to be willing to forgive people, and mm-hmm. you have to be willing to let things go. And I think that my ability and very publicness and openness about being able to let things go makes people feel like they can work with me if they make a mistake. Gotcha. Uh, and, and it's true. Like, I just don't stay angry very long. I might get really mad in the moment about something, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and maybe within 15 minutes I'm over it. Okay. That's just how it is. And if someone needs something from me, if they need help growing their affiliate, that's mm-hmm. like a big one. I'm going to help them. I don't care if they've been a little bit of a jerk to me in an email or publicly at a convention or whatever, because that's just not what this is about. Okay. It's not about scorekeeping or who was rude to what. There are a lot of rude, coarse personalities in the Libertarian Party. It is what it is, right? And I think as a leader, you have to be willing to accept that and, and move on. Okay. I agree. Um, do you feel like you've personally done a good job? And this is not going to be something that anybody could necessarily argue with you on because I'm thinking like just internally in your own thoughts. Do you feel like you've done a pretty good job at what you just said, forgiving other people, even if they haven't really stopped their, that, that behavior, if they've just kind of continued on? Or maybe they didn't ask, you know, like seek out and say, hey, I apologize or anything. I think you've done a pretty good job? Yeah. And I think forgiveness isn't about whether or not you're going to grant someone else a certain set of rights. Mm -hmm. It's really, for me, it's about me and my ability to let something go and my mental health and, like, whether or not I'm a mature adult. Okay. I think that that's really what forgiveness is about. Yeah, there are certain things that, you know, it's difficult to forgive someone for. I haven't encountered that yet in the LP. Well, let's hope not. Let's hope you don't come across that. And if it does, I still have to be professional and, right. and maintain that professionalism and work with people if I have to work with them. It doesn't mean they need to be my best friend or I have to invite them over to dinner, but I need to respond to their emails. Mm-hmm. And I need to, you know, if we're assigned to work on a project together, I have to do it. Gotcha. I don't think it's that complicated, but when there are a lot of people involved and emotions are running high and there's all this like arguing on social media, I get why people get dragged down by it. Right. So that's a great segue into my next question. And to give a little bit of background here, uh, I want to lay some foundation for it. So several years ago in Jacksonville, the railroad company, CSX, brought in a new CEO, and he made some radical changes. And it kind of sounds like you want to also make some radical changes as well, or at least in some, for, for some people it will be radical. Right? Maybe it won't be necessarily – I don't think it's going to be as radical as what he did. I don't know if you had even heard about it. Probably not because you're out in California, but they were pretty radical. Um, and some months later, uh, there were some news articles that were highlighting some delivery problems from the railroad. And the CEO said this, and I'm, I'm quoting here. He said, this resistance to change has resulted in some service disruptions. And 
end quote there. I objected saying that as a leader, his plan should have considered that resistance and that the failure actually lay on his shoulders. And then I also objected, it really came across like, I'm the leader, but I'm blaming all the workers. It's their fault for not engaging in my vision that was so great and, and, and wondrous. So if, if you're elected to chair of the LNC, it, it feels like just from watching things online, it feels like you're all but guaranteed to have some level of resistance. And so how will you prepare and lead the party to be successful and implement your vision knowing that this resistance is probably going to come? Oh, well, you got to change the culture before you can institute any radical changes if you want anything to stick. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I've done is already laid the groundwork to establish good relationships with the people who are already on the LNC. Okay. I ha not every single one of them. There's a lot of people. Right. But I'm already in a very active communication, you know, with, with Ken Molman and with Karen Ann Harlos and with a handful of other people. I reach out and make phone calls. I want to talk to them and see what's going on. What are their concerns? before I start trying to push something else. Okay. In LA County, it took me a year to get rid of the infighting, a year to change the culture, like really change it, and a year to get us to start doing productive, meaningful work. I think that things have to go in that order. Okay. Uh, so I don't anticipate that I'm gonna be able to come in uh, and wield like a cudgel to make a bunch of radical changes. Gotcha. So, would it be fair to say, since it took a county two years to get to the point where you could start instituting some of these changes, that it might take the national level two years or even longer? It could. LA County has 250 members. Okay. We're the ninth largest organization, like libertarian organization in the country. We're bigger mm -hmm. than most state parties. We're okay. bigger than at least 40 state parties. Wow. So, LA's huge. Right. It's not just like, you know... Um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a tremendous amount of work. But you know, if you lay the if you lay the groundwork immediately before you get in the job and you start working on other people and getting them on board and not trying to ram through something that they're not in support of, it could probably happen a little bit faster. Okay. Yeah, I do intend to change the messaging. That might be something that it is going to change radically okay and when I say radically I don't mean that it's going to be edgelord you know offensive messaging right but I intend it to be goal-oriented purpose-driven principled and outspoken gotcha. and I don't believe that's what we're seeing right now but I also don't anticipate to gut the entire LNC structure move everything around for the mm -hmm. sake of moving it that's not Sure, there are things that, like that that I'd like to do, but it, the reality of it is that that's just not fruitful or productive. Right. You know, I, we have to make incremental changes so that they stick. So, bouncing off that, do you have any off-the-cuff examples of this is the kind of messaging we're getting now? And you can make them up. I mean, it doesn't have to be an actual one. Uh, but this is the kind of messaging that we're getting now, and this is what I would actually like it to say to kind of okay. get a get a. And I, I would like the. Because it seems like it's either edgelord or maybe yep. boring. Yep. And so I'd like to see what that in-between sounds like. Absolutely. So I have a media team in the California Mises Caucus, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, compo it's composed of professional people who work in the media, arts and entertainment industry. And they did interviews with small businesses okay. uh, who were affected during the lockdown. I remember seeing that. They are very heartfelt. They are very compassionate, but they are very against lockdowns. That is the kind of messaging that we need. Does it offend people? It does not really offend libertarians. I'm sure there are some people out there who are gonna clutch their pearls and say you should stay locked down. But we, when you interview a business owner who's crying and saying that you know her life's work, her family business is being shut down, this doesn't seem like it's helping people, it's right. harming me. That's really tough to argue with. Sure. And it's very bold. And it's, and it's pretty unapologetic. We're not right. saying, sorry, we just, you know, uh, maybe lockdowns, like it's saying lockdowns hurt people. That's the kind of messaging I think we need at the national level. So I've already got those examples out there. Gotcha. So, yeah, so it sounds like then the messaging is a lot less, you know, me just kind of using it as an example, like me going out and trying to type up something that's uh, catchy and rather instead of, instead of us speaking, saying, let's hear from the people. Let's hear from the people. When we do 
you know, type up our tweets or Facebook posts or whatever. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done by people who are skilled. Right. We need skilled messengers. We don't just need people who are fired up and passionate. Right. I love people who are fired up and passionate. But sometimes, you know, if you're not careful, sometimes people fly off the rails. They make honest mistakes. Right. And I'm sure there are still bound to be a handful of mistakes because oh, we're yeah. imperfect people, right? Right. And you can't expect perfection. But we can be careful with who we select. We can look through people's, like, social media history, for example, and be like, this person is a great example. Like, I already have, like, a handful of people in mind who I'm okay. like, okay, so your messaging isn't offensive, but it's bold and it's unapologetic libertarian messaging. This is what I'd like to see at the national level. Gotcha. You know, I like to tell people, um, it, you. I feel like there's this argument where it's either bold or unprincipled. And then bold tends to come across as edgelord, as you said a right. moment ago. And I point out, I say, you know, there's like 100,000 words in the English language that, yep. that are in common use. And surely there's some collection of them that can be put out to say what you want to say and, and use it and do it in a way so that it's tempering what otherwise might actually be offensive. Yes. And I feel like we did that on one particular amendment in our, uh, in our county for the last election in Florida. So there were some amendments. And there were some concern, concern and rumors. I cannot speak to whether or not the rumors were actually true. People get their perceptions. But there was a particular amendment, and what it would do is it would allow um, it, 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 there was a uh, some sort of tax break. I can't remember exactly, but there was like a tax break that was offered to veterans. And then the question was, should this tax break roll over to their spouse when the veteran passed away? And then, of course, everything went into the spouse's name. And the concern was, what we're doing is we're you know in the first place we are saying this particular class of people get an extra break. All the other groups, anybody that's not inside that particular class of people, veterans, do not. And then, you know, then we'd be rolling it over to another class of people. And, but the challenge, of course, is if you say, no, veterans shouldn't get this, it basically sounds like veterans don't deserve this. That's how it comes across. And so when we went to put out our recommendations, our affiliate was really adamant that we wanted to say, no, we oppose this. And I was adamant that we say it in a way that doesn't distract from what we're trying to say. And because if I say something really rude to you, then what we end up talking about is how I said it, not really what I was saying. And so we constructed a message and, you know, we kind of led off with, you know, hey, we respect veterans and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We also recognize that veterans, you know, have went to war and many of them do so because they, you know, we believe, even if libertarians don't, but as a society, we believe that they're doing it to secure our freedom. But more importantly, that it's so that everybody can be treated equal and nobody is elevated another, above another person, including veterans. And that we felt like by extending this, what we, what we were effectively doing was solidifying this idea that some people are above other people even if they're people that we might otherwise want to respect you know and I, and I have no problem with respecting a veteran uh, whatsoever you know because n number of reasons we don't need to get into so it sounds like you're you know something along is, does that sound about like what you're thinking yeah take whatever the issue is come up with a statement on it mm -hmm. right maybe a paragraph and then chisel that down so that you can have several good sound bites that come out of that, good quotable things. Mm -hmm. And then just get, you know, get kind of a consensus on it if you're if you're struggling. Right. So we kind of briefly mentioned New Hampshire a little bit. We've also talked about messaging. This is currently um, a bit of an issue going on right now. There's a lot of talk. I don't believe that it's appropriate to really have any firm opinions just yet. It just doesn't seem like that. Uh, it seems like a lot of people still have a lot of unanswered questions, or at least a few unanswered questions. Uh, but I do have a question about the oath, and I, I'm assuming that you probably read it. So, for anybody that's watching, um, uh, just very, very briefly, there is a issue over in New Hampshire where there are now two affiliates: one that is recognized, and the one that is recognized is newer, and the old one is no longer recognized, and 
only, I believe, one person or a handful of people have basically transferred over. That's not the issue I want to talk about. In the process of doing that, they created new bylaws and they also created a, um, a new oath. And I took issue with the oath. So let me read this oath. It says, I will not advocate or endorse the initiation of force as a means to achieve political or social goals. So that's the first part. It's very similar to the NAP that we all agree to when we go to the, uh, when we um, sign up with the national level or even the state of Florida, we have the same one. It goes on and it says, I will advocate for the freedom from oppression and coercion for all New Hampshire residents and affirm that as libertarians, we condemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant. Now, the first two parts, I don't have any issue with. Um, uh, I'm okay with that. It's that third part that kind of gets me. Now, it does come from our national platform. And here's the thing. Here's what I said in a tweet. I said, condemning bigotry as irrational and repugnant is a great sentiment. It's not a good oath for a party whose members have strong disagreements on what constitutes bigotry and when the textbook definition is broad enough to include them all. So my question to you is, do you agree with that? Why and why not? Why or why not? I don't believe that that should be in an oath. Okay. I get called a bigot all the time. Right. I'm not quite sure why. I guess because I have friends that other people don't like. Mm -hmm. Guilt by association. I don't know that I'm actually friends with any bigots. I guess a bigot is like someone you disagree with. Mm -hmm. Sure, we could look up the textbook definition of bigot, but that's not why I get called a bigot. Right. You know, uh, there are people who don't like pineapple on pizza. Are they bigots? Right. Like this just gets so out of hand. I don't think that it's appropriate to make that an oath. And yeah, it's in the party platform. Eh, I have mixed feelings on that. Mm -hmm. No, I won't be working to get that out of the platform. That is just not the hill that I'm going to die on. Right. But I, you know, the platform isn't an oath. Correct. It's not. And there are a couple of things in the platform I'm not so, you know, I'm not like, oh, I don't know, you know, like the abortion plank. I'm agnostic on it. Right. I don't have a strong opinion on a couple of things, so I'm like, all right. You know, I'm not I'm not 100% sold on some of the language and the immigration plank. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. I wouldn't have worded it that way. Right. So. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I, you know, I was having a debate with somebody online, and one of the, I, I noticed that a lot of people have quoted that particular portion of the platform when they're dealing with personalities online. Mm -hmm. And I find it a little bit problematic, and tell me if I'm wrong, by all means. My understanding is that we're not bound by the platform. Right. So there, it, it, it kind of doesn't mean anything to say you're in violation of it, in a sense. Um, not that you can't be in violation of it, but in this particular case, it just says, we condemn this, as irrational and repugnant and I'm like well I think a lot of things might be irrational and repugnant and I might condemn them but that doesn't necessarily mean that there should be some punishment necessarily right. for somebody violating it right and then the other point that I made and I don't remember which year it was but I went back and I was looking at some of the old platforms and it didn't used to I think that was the particular item that did not used to be in there correct and so I look at it and I say it's kind of hard to really you know, suggest that anything punitive should happen to somebody for violating it, whatever, however that means, however anything is defined, when one, um, you, you know, in, in one um, national uh, business meeting, it's present, and then the next one, it's not, which to me means that the platform can be changed. Right. And so if I disagree with it... Yeah. Well, that's the only way that it can be changed. Somebody somewhere along the line said, hey, we should add this in. Apparently the delegates, I assume, agreed with it because it is there now. And then in the future, delegates might say, hey, you know what? Turns out this is causing more problems than it's, you know, than it's benefiting the party. Maybe we should remove it because people are you know, kind of using that as some sort of pretext to mm -hmm. say something about someone's membership or their mm -hmm. libertarianness. And, you know, so am I wrong in thinking this about the platform? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's some, there's some bigotry that I don't think is irrational. It's okay. just something I disagree with. Right. There are conservative Christian people. I mean, social conservatives. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe Republicans too. Whatever. Let's talk about everyone. Right. 
who believe that homosexual homosexuality is wrong according to biblical standards. Mm -hmm. They're not being irrational. They're pointing to something and they're saying it's this is why, you know, and they'll make some biological arguments or whatever. And we can all disagree with them, right. but I don't think they're being irrational. And they're not always rude about it. Correct. So I don't know if that's being a bigot. It's so subjective. Some people right. will say it is, and they'll be very passionate about it. They're entitled to their opinion. And other people will say, no, I just disagree. I just think they're wrong. Right. You know, it's just so all over the place. And the platform, it changes all the time. Mm -hmm. This is why we argue about it every two years. Right. You know? Um, I mean, we just had a debate in there about yeah. our own platform, and we did come to a consensus. And, uh, you know, we moved along. Yep. Yep, California, we made seven or eight changes to our platform at our convention last month. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's the way it is. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't think that's a wise move. I think that making an oath out of part of the platform, especially that part, is sort of inviting cancel culture mm -hmm. into the Libertarian Party and uh, literally canceling people okay. over maybe an out-of-context screenshot on social media, right? a meme that everyone laughed at. Sure. You know? Is there one in mind that you're thinking of? Oh, there's like dozens. Okay. <laughs> there's like so many, you know. Right. It just it happens all the time. People will, in bad faith, take a comment that was a joke or just out of context, or maybe you're quoting someone rhetorically and they assign that to you, and, mm -hmm. and then it's like, oh, let's cancel them, you know. And now it could be, let's cancel their membership. Right. And that just doesn't seem like a good leadership move. The, the concern that I had is that, and let's just use you and I as an example. Let's say that you did something, and, and we have that oath. We're in the same state. We have that oath. We both have agreed to it. And then you say something that somebody else deems as a bigoted statement. And then I look at it and I say, actually, I don't think it was a bigoted statement. Well, then I'm not condemning you for that. Right. And I feel like it puts somebody like me at jeopardy, mm -hmm. even though I actually didn't say it. I may not agree with the, you know, some some of the, what, you know, whatever you said. I might just say, oh, you know, I disagree, but I don't think it was bigoted. Right. And I feel like it puts me in a position to have to defend my membership. Yeah. To somebody else, because what if the group, the larger body of the group, said no, we believe that it was bigoted, and since DL is not condemning it, he goes out right along with you. Right. And, and I feel like that's the big concern. It starts a big witch hunt. It does, I, I, think so. I think so, because it's basically telling people that you have to react in a particular way when somebody else behaves in a particular way, mm -hmm. but the problem is it's not really a particular way because it's really vague and open. What does it mean to be bigoted? I, I had a debate with Archie Flower on, on you know, um, uh, so my podcast is connected to uh, Free Speech Media Network. It's just a group of podcasters that got together and said, we're going to have this little network. And uh, one of the gentlemen uh, had his own podcast where he would basically bring on people and debate. And I debated him on you know the issue of bigotry. And I think that people that are taking an issue with bigotry have some wildly wrong views. Yep. Uh, not that... Not that I always say that, hey, that's an okay thing to say, um, but more along the lines of, like, what should we do about it? Right. And I think that's what gets me. If we weren't talking about what we're going to do about it, like, are we going to kick you out, you know, or are we not, you know, we, we're going to force you to, to agree to this, you know. And it's funny because the very beginning, and in, 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 in tell me if you agree with this, the very beginning is the standard uh, non-aggression principle pledge which says you know I agree that we won't use force to uh, further social or political goals even that's subjective it is what does it mean to use f force there's an argument right? about it right now we know what it means to use like say physical force if I punch somebody most everybody's gonna agree but I feel like most I feel like more people agree with that particular sentiment than do the the last one which is the bigotry one and there's even a debate over that. Yep. You know, to what extent does that mean? Uh, so I think we have to be very, very careful when we're when we're using these terms. When they're, if I say a, if I say I'm a 
a dentist, everybody immediately knows exactly what that means. Yeah. There's no ambiguity. There's no lack of clarity. If I say I'm against bigotry, we think we know what that means. And I find that I, 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 when I just observe people, I feel like uh, they find out that, oh, wow, this person doesn't see it this way. They, they, they feel shocked. And I think it's because they made a lot, a lot of assumptions about what bigotry means. So I, I don't know if you agree with all of that. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think free speech is a very important concept. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the First Amendment. I'm right. talking about free speech, just the concept of it. Right. Uh, it's what we use to form ideas, to sort of kind of stumble around when we're trying to come up with something, and to say things that aren't actually that great, and then right. to get corrected, right. and to learn and to grow. Right. And when we start instituting these thought crime policies, it pushes all of that underground, it stifles mm -hmm. it, and we don't know what people are thinking because they're afraid to speak out. And then if they do have an idea that's sort of ill-conceived or you know we think they're wrong about something or mm -hmm. could be refined, we don't have the opportunity to correct it. Right. And it also creates a culture of fear, and then we're mistrustful of each other. Right. So I think that we need to be more generous with people's speech, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't need to thought police people's memes on social media. We don't need to clutch our pearls at every offensive thing. Right. We need to just be adults and talk about it and not call each other names and, and bigots just because someone says something that we deem inappropriate. Have a conversation about it instead. Right. You know, I've noticed that in, you know, I get online and I, um, I challenge pretty much everybody. It doesn't really matter who you are. Um, I've challenged you know, people that are on the, the, the Mises caucus side, if you will. I've challenged them online in private com communication. I've also challenged them in person to their face. I make it a rule that I try not to say anything online that I wouldn't say to your face. Um, and the other thing is I feel like you can challenge somebody even pretty significantly and still gain their respect. Yes. And I've done that where I don't really want to name any names. I don't like doing that. But there was a, um, there was a particular, I don't want to say situation, but there was a particular uh, uh, time where somebody was kind of relishing an event. And I said, I don't think we should be relishing it. I think we should just say, look, these are the things that happen. You know, sometimes people reap what they sow. We need to move on. And the person was upset with me, and they were like, "But they were upset with me in a in a way that wasn't it, it wasn't rude, it wasn't insulting, it wasn't like, hey, Dio, you're a terrible person. I can't believe you.' It was just like, more, come on, man, really, seriously, like, this was my opportunity to feel a little bit good about this." past negative situation and you're taking it from me okay and it but here's the thing like i'm still friends with that person yeah um they did not resort to insult right they, they were upset don't get me wrong and it's cool i, I get it it's I, I think that's the problem with the i think if i had to point out one thing that i have an issue with in the culture of the libertarian community is that people don't seem to do two things one they don't give criticism very well because it usually comes with insult and they don't take criticism right. very well. And I think people need to learn to do both and say, look, you know what? I, I, I respect you in general, but this thing right here, that's not working for me. And I think you were wildly wrong on this. And I'm going to tell you about it, but I don't hate you and I'm not going to insult you. I'm not going to call you all kind of names. And I think the people that are receiving it need to do the same thing. And um, do you see that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like you should be able to express an opinion without insulting someone. Mm -hmm. And I think a person who is maybe receiving that con criticism can take it constructively and they don't even have to agree with you. They can be like, all right, well, we disagree on that. Right. Whatever. Moving on. Yeah. You know, and it's up to that person whether or not they want to take your constructive criticism and, you know, reorient themselves or change their behavior. But I just don't think, I don't think it's, a, it should be such a big deal. Mm -hmm. To have disagreements right and I think that that's part of the problem that comes with social media culture there's a lot of great things about social media mm -hmm. you know we can communicate with each other and interact and know what's going on in each other's lives but we're quick to insult someone 
or just oh, cut someone off because oh, right. oh, I hate what they just said. We're done. Right. They're a bigot. Yeah. They're evil. And it's like because they expressed one view you disagreed with. Right. Come on, you agree with everything in your family. H have you cut them off? Right. No. Didn't you have you know those fights with your siblings growing up? Didn't you get over that? Like, right. can we get over this one disagreement? Right. Yeah, and, and, and I think you, I think people will find that they actually grow as a person. Yes. I was picked on notoriously. I mean, I mean it's kind of obvious here. You're a bit taller than me, but when I was, uh, when I was younger, I was pretty scrawny. Um, you know, I was, I was short and I was just scrawny, so there was like nothing to me. So there was no reason for anybody to, like kids two grades younger than me were not intimidated by me, okay? Like I didn't get any of those kind of advantages whatsoever. And I got picked on quite a bit in junior high. And I, I, you know, I turned to comedy, mm -hmm. and I learned not necessarily professionally. I, I would, I'm terrible at, you know, rehearsed and practiced comedy. I, it just nosedives. But I would be really smart aleck, and I would just like have these comments out of nowhere. And I learned that um, one defense is to go further than people were willing to tolerate, which is a bad thing, uh, because for many years. You know, you would say something to me, and I would take it to a level that would, you know, make a sailor blush, so to speak, right? It was just, it, that was pretty rough, and that was like a defense mechanism. And I'm not saying that everybody does that. Um, but as I got a little bit older, I started reeling it in. And so I realized that even though I took it too far, it still was something of value, right, to learn from my experience. And I think it's helped shape me to where I am now. Um, I did have to, you know, I unfortunately did go too far and then I had to come back. Um, maybe not everybody does, you know. Uh, but I think these things are over. And I don't want to, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying bullying is okay. <laughs> what I'm saying is I think we need to start looking for opportunities for growth yes. in our own selves. Yes. First. Yes. You know. I, I'm a big fan of the Jordan Peterson trope, clean up your room. Yep. You should work on yourself and try to get your own affairs in order mm -hmm. before you start going out and condemning other people right. and trying to change their mind or even trying to change your organization. Right. Uh, and, and I think that's the best way to affect change, too, is to have yourself sorted out. Gotcha. Do you feel you have yourself sorted out? Well, you know, it's a work in progress, but it okay. is something that I have actively worked on since about okay. 2016. Uh, um, I've been very mindful of that. Some of the things that I have worked on for my own personal growth are to be very honest and forthright with people. Mm -hmm. I used to care very much what people thought about me and I wanted to please them and not have anyone be mad. And I have learned that being direct and very honest with people is very disarming and that people actually appreciate it. Because everybody will tell you what they think you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not beneficial or edifying to someone in the long run. Right. People deserve to hear the truth. It is good for them. Gotcha. And you do it in person? I do it in person. Okay. Uh, All right. Fair straight enough. Straight to someone's face. Gotcha. I mean, I, I don't know. I've got this weird thing where, you know, I, I said it earlier. If you wouldn't say it to their face, you should not say Correct. it. Uh, Correct. And that comes from a few punches in the mouth when I was younger. Yeah. For saying things that I should not have said. <laughs> So I learned the hard way. Uh, I don't wish it on anybody, but, uh, you know, it was a good lesson. Yeah. It was an unpleasant lesson, but it was definitely a good lesson. This is what I mean. Like, these negative experiences can be beneficial if you right. allow them to be. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, this is not an excuse for bullying, so this is not what I'm saying. Uh, that's an entirely different topic that, I'll, you know, one day maybe I'll sit down and, and, and do a podcast on that, but couple other things I've had to work on mm -hmm. that I think translate into the Libertarian Party is I did work on literally cleaning up my room. Okay. I got rid of like half the stuff I own. Okay. I, my house was a mess. And I was like, this is cluttered and this is terrible and I need to focus on what's essential to my life. And it gives you a lot of like clarity and mm -hmm. vision about what you want your life to look like. Right. Uh, the environment that you want to be in, what you want to be surrounded by, like literally, physically. Gotcha. I cleaned up some of my friends. Mm -hmm. I found that I had frequently surrounded myself by people who would drag me down mm -hmm. and I was less productive and struggled to get things done because I had friends who were just like a mess and I didn't have to cut them off in some dramatic way because I don't think that that's particularly 
a nice thing to do to someone, but I just had to gently let some of those relationships go. I've also had to learn to be more organized. I am very much a right brain creative person. I'm, you know, used to being kind of scattered all over the place, coming up with ideas, and I had to learn to sort of rein that in and master it and be good with spreadsheets, be good with documents management, pay attention to detail, be good at proofreading, planning things, mapping things out. And those are all skills that are really good for you personally, but they translate really well to organizational structure and success. Awesome. Well, that sounds great. I don't have any questions. You got anything further that you would like people to know? Yeah. If you're interested in following my chair race for national, you can go to AngelaMcArdle.com. I put up a lot of information on that site. I also have a Patreon where I post most of my uh, convention speeches and a Substack where I post that as well. And the LA County Convention is coming up July 10th. If you're in Los Angeles or nearby, you're welcome to attend. It'll be at the Reason Foundation at 12 p.m. And if you want to join our Libertarian Party, you can do that at lplac.us. Awesome. Well, thank you for being on the show. And that's a wrap, folks. I hope you really enjoyed it and got something out of it. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. That's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the interview and got something useful from it. Drop me a comment from wherever you are watching from or hit me up on Twitter at Liberty Dad Pod. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And make sure you check out other associated podcasts over at facebook.com forward slash free speech media network. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.